In a memorable scene in the 1993 comedy Mrs. Doubtfire, unemployed voice actor Daniel Hillard, played by Robin Williams, comes across a set of plastic toy dinosaurs and uses them to compose a catchy rap. I'm a raptor, doing what I can, gonna eat everything till the appearance of man. Yo, yo, see me. I'm living beneath the soil. I'll be back, but I'm coming as oil. As well as showcasing the incomparable Williams at the height of his improvisational powers, this scene illustrates a common myth that has persisted for decades, that crude oil derives from the bodies of dinosaurs. People believe this? But as romantic and logical as this notion might seem, after all, why else would oh, we call them fossil fuels? It simply isn't true. Everyone's favorite prehistoric reptiles have nothing to do with the black gold that powers and is slowly killing the modern world. But how did this myth come to be in the first place? Surprisingly, unlike many modern myths, this one can almost be entirely traced back to a single source. It's an origin story that involves a corporate giant, two of the greatest cultural events of the 20th century, and a case of clever, if misleading, marketing. When petroleum, the word derived from the Greek words for stone and oil, is derived from ancient organisms, the organisms in question are far smaller and less glamorous than dinosaurs, microscopic ocean-dwelling plants and animals known as algae and zooplankton. Oh, when these organisms die, they rain down onto the ocean floor, gradually piling up in thick layers. These deposits of organic matter are then covered over with layers of silt, pushing them ever deeper beneath the surface. Over millions of years, the silt layers build up to a kilometer or more in thickness, slowly solidifying into sedimentary rocks such as shale. The immense pressure of this rock pressing down upon the remains of the plankton and algae creates the ideal conditions for converting these remains into petroleum. The first step in this process occurs until the remains are 10 meters below the surface and involves the decomposition of the plankton and algae by anaerobic bacteria, which do not require oxygen to survive. These bacteria break down sulfates and nitrates in the organism's bodies into hydrogen sulfide and nitrogen and polysaccharides and proteins into simple sugars and amino acids and eventually strip the remains of most of their nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, leaving behind mostly carbon and hydrogen. Past 10 meters in depth, the heat and pressure exerted by the overlying rock layers kill the bacteria and halts decomposition. Now begins the next stage of petroleum formation, the recombination of the simple hydrocarbons produced by the bacteria into a solid wax-like substance known as kerogen. This process continues until a depth of around one kilometer, below which the third step can begin, the conversion of kerogen into petroleum. This process is highly sensitive to temperature and can only occur within a narrow range known as the oil window. Below the window, the hydrocarbons remain trapped as kerogens, while above the window, the heat and pressure decompose the kerogens into lighter to hydrocarbons like methane creating natural gas. To be easily accessible and extractable, petroleum and natural gas must be expelled from the source rock where it was formed and accumulate in a reservoir. A typical reservoir or trap consists of a layer of permeable stone covered in a layer of impermeable cap rock like sandstone or salt which traps the oil and gas and prevents it from reaching the surface. To extract the petroleum, oil workers drill down through the cap rock into the reservoir, in most cases the pressure of the natural gas which accumulates at the top of the reservoir causes the oil to flow back up the borehole on its own. After this pressure dissipates, however, the remainder of the oil must be actively pumped out. While this is the traditional method for extracting oil in recent years, advances in technology and the depletion of traditional oil reserves has led to the increased exploitation of more unconventional reservoirs. These include oil shale, immature source rock that has not yet expelled its petroleum into a reservoir, and oil sands, deposits of sands or sandstone stone into which petroleum has seeped and solidified to form a hard, sticky substance called bitumen or pitch. And for more on the strange properties of this substance, please do check out our previous video, waiting for the drop. For the vast majority of Earth's petroleum deposits, the conversion process from plankton and algae to oil and gas began between 250 to 360 million years ago during the Carboniferous and Permian periods, long before the Mesozoic era when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Furthermore, the biomass of all the dinosaurs that ever lived during their 188 million year reign is dwarfed by the sheer mass of plankton and algae biomass in the oceans, meaning that if oil was made from dinosaurs, there would be significantly less of it around for us to extract. So, if oil is not made from dinosaurs, why then do we call it fossil fuel? 
Well, contrary to popular belief, the term fossil does not mean petrified organism. Rather, it is derived from the Latin fossilis, meaning obtained by digging. The term fossil fuel was coined in 1759 by German chemist Caspar Newman to differentiate oil and coal, itself formed from the remains of ancient plants converted by heat and pressure into carbon from surface-based fuels such as wood. Given these common misconceptions, it is tempting to think that the oil is made of dinosaurs myth was simply the product of associating fossil fuels with fossils and fossils with dinosaurs. In reality, however, the origin of this myth is far more specific and involves one of history's greatest producers of petroleum, the Sinclair Oil Corporation. Founded in 1916 by Harry F. Sinclair, Sinclair Oil quickly grew into the seventh largest oil company in the U.S. and the largest in the American Midwest. The company's first association with dinosaurs came in 1930, when it launched a series of oil cans featuring illustrations of 12 different dinosaurs. The cans were part of an advertising campaign to promote Pennsylvania and opaline brand lubricants derived from crude oil, then thought to have been formed during the Mesozoic era. The campaign was a hit, with the Brontosaurus proving so popular that Sinclair read registered it as a company trademark in 1932. Dubbed Dino, the green Brontosaurus logo soon became a familiar sight along American highways, adorning hundreds of Sinclair service stations across the country. The following year, Sinclair sponsored a dinosaur-themed exhibit at the 1933-1934 Century of Progress World's Fair in Chicago, which featured nine life-sized model dinosaurs in recreated prehistoric settings. An accompanying exhibit educated visitors about the prehistoric origins of petroleum and how the company extracted, refined, and distributed petroleum products around the world. Sinclair's aim in linking dinosaurs with oil was to convince its customers that better oil came from older deposits, with its advertising literature touting that its products were mellowed 80 million years. Unfortunately, the public took the association a little too literally, and the myth that oil came from dinosaurs was thusly born. Sinclair's 1933 exhibit was a smash hit and one of the most popular attractions at the fair, prompting the company to go all in on dinosaur-themed branding. A line of colorful rubber brontosaurus toys soon appeared for sale at Sinclair service stations, while an anthropomorphic dino dressed as a service attendant promoted Sinclair products in print advertisements. Some Sinclair stations even built life-size models of the company mascot, straddling the entrance, creating readily visible highway landmarks. Around the same time, Sinclair entered a partnership with American paleontologist Barnum Brown, curator of fossil reptiles at the American Museum of Natural History and the discoverer of the first Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton in 1902. In exchange for funding his expeditions, Brown wrote promotional materials for Sinclair and designed a series of dinosaur-themed stamps which proved so popular that the first printing sold out in a single day. Sinclair restaged its 1933 exhibit at the Texas Centennial Exposition in 1936 and the New York World's Fair in 1939, wowing visitors and further cementing the link between dinosaurs and oil in the popular imagination. 24 years later, the company achieved yet another publicity milestone when its famous logo made its debut as a giant balloon in the 1963 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The balloon proved so popular that in 1975, Dino was named an honorary member of the Museum of Natural History. But Dino's greatest triumph would come the following year, when Sinclair staged an enhanced version of its 1933 exhibit called Dino Land at the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair, which featured nine dinosaur models designed by famed sculptor and diorama maker Louis Paul Jonas. Improved technology allowed all nine of the models, including the Brontosaurus, to be fitted with animatronics and placed in lifelike environments complete with a bubbling volcano and flashing lighting, creating an experience Sinclair touted as lifelike and authentic as modern science and painstaking research can make it. Having learned the power of merchandising from its previous exhibits, Sinclair made sure that Dino Land kept plenty of keepsakes on hand for visitors to take home, including a book titled Sinclair and the Exciting World of Dinosaurs. But perhaps the most popular attraction at Dino Land and the fair as a whole was the Moldorama machine, which for a mere 25 cents injection molded one of seven plastic dinosaur figures right in front of the user's eyes. Doubtless the proliferation of tiny dinosaurs made of plastic and material from oil helped to further cement the link between the two in the minds of impressionable fair-going children. The connection was likely not lost on their parents either, for Sinclair service stations were prominently featured in both of the fair's parking lots. Despite incidents like two dinosaurs being mysterious, 
mysteriously stolen in 1965, Dino Land once again proved a smash hit, being seen by nearly 50 million visitors over the fair's two seasons. Indeed, the exhibit attracted attention even before the fair's opening, as the exhibit's nine dinosaurs traveled 200 kilometers by barge down the Hudson River to the fairgrounds in Queens. After the fair closed, Sinclair rode the wave of publicity by sending the exhibit's dinosaurs on a tour of American shopping centers, after which the models were sold off to various museums and parks. Today, all but one of the original nine dinosaurs are still on display, with the two most popular, Tyrannosaurus and Brontosaurus, residing at Dinosaur Valley State Park near Glen Rose, Texas. Much has been learned about the prehistoric world since the time of the New York World's Fair. For example, we now know that the species of Sinclair's mascot, Brontosaurus, did not actually exist and uh, was mistakenly created by paleontologist Othniel Marsh in 1896 by combining the body of an Apatosaurus with the head of a Camarasaurus. We have also learned that the vast majority of petroleum deposits predate the age of the dinosaurs, disproving even the tentative link that Sinclair R was trying to make in its exhibits and advertisements. But the damage is already done, and thanks to a clever marketing campaign nearly a century ago, the myth that oil is made of dinosaurs will likely persist for decades to come. One can only hope that by then, the use of fossil fuels will finally have gone the way of the dinosaurs.